is greater than all. Father, we worship you, we exalt you, we lift your name on high. Who is like you, our God? Yes, the one who is glorious in holiness, fearful in praises. The one who has a name that's high above every other name, at the mention of whose name, the name Jesus. Every knee of things in heaven, of things on earth, of things beneath the earth, must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, we worship you. We exalt you. We give you praise. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your loving mercy, for your loving kindness. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, as scripture says, but for your mercies would have all been consumed. Lord, we thank you. The more we learn, the more we go into the book of Romans, the more you reveal to us your goodness, your love. Yes, for us. You love us so much. You put everything in place for us, Lord, to live lives that you designed from the very beginning that we should live. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We honor you. We bless you. Be thou glorified, be thou exalted. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And so, Father, as we're going into, as we're continuing today, Lord, mainly from the book of Romans chapter 9, uh, Father, we ask, some of these issues are big, weighty issues, but Lord, that is you, that is who you are. We ask, Father, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you today so that we may know you better. Father, we ask, Lord, I ask for myself and for my listeners today that the eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our hearts be enlightened and flooded with light so that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and your exceedingly great power toward in and for us who believe. Father, I ask that you fill us with the knowledge of your will through our spiritual wisdom and understanding through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Father, I ask that you open up our eyes, that we may behold wonderful things out of your word today. Father, I ask that you open up our ears, that we may hear you, that we may hear what your Spirit is saying to us as individuals and as a church. Father, I ask that you open up our hearts and our minds, that we may understand the Scriptures. Father, cause us to know. Cause us to comprehend. Help us to grasp it, Father, what you're saying to us. Let nothing be missing today. Let's get it. No confusion. Let us all get it. Bring us up, Father, to your level in the name of Jesus. We ask for revelation. Open us up, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Uh, wow. Okay. Today, I pray by God's grace, we'll do better on time. So, but I want to spend the first uh, few minutes to kind of just uh, wrap up Romans chapter 8 and set us up for the lesson for today, which is out of Romans chapter 9 because we had to kind of leave early last week, and I promised that we would try and wrap this up. Okay, Romans chapter 8 starts off, if you remember very well from uh, last week, saying that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, simply because of what Jesus has already done on the cross. And if you are in him, you believe in him, God sees you as you've done everything, as Christ has paid the price for you. And so... There's nothing else to condemn. He's already condemned sin in Christ. So there's, you're no longer under any condemnation. So what then happens is that opens up you up for life in the spirit, to live a spirit-led life, to live a life in which the Holy Spirit is in control. The Holy Spirit is the one now helping you to live the life that God designed for you to live from the very beginning. And we went into how the Holy Spirit helps you to live above sin, 
how you have an obligation now to follow the Spirit and not follow your flesh. Now, we also said, the flesh is still there, but the power to control you is gone now. You have set free from that. But you still have a choice to make, to listen to the Spirit and follow the Spirit. Because if you do that, you will live. I believe I also mentioned the fact that it also helps you to be healthy because the Spirit, as long as you are listening to Him, will give life to your mortal body, even though your body is designed to die, to fall sick, and all those things that happen because of sin. But because of the Spirit, as long as you are listening to the Spirit, you have access to living a life of health. And then um, I believe I concluded by how the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, a major area of our weakness being knowing what to pray for as we ought to, which we all don't know because we can only see so far. God has all these things in place. Part of what we're going to talk about shortly in Romans chapter 9, how God has his plans and um, some things happen. We may see it one way and be praying one way, whereas... God, the Father, the Spirit, they see how God is working those things together for our good and would have us pray in accordance to his will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, all right. So Romans, I'll just read Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30. It says, and we know, in fact, let me start from verse 20, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know. So, again, you have to know how Paul writes. He's writing on the expression of the Spirit, and he, he suddenly seems to take a turn. But he's trying to say something. So he's, he leaves us in verse 27 by saying, the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And then verse 28, it's as if the Spirit now leads him to start saying, you know what, let's talk a little bit about the will of God here. I don't know if we catch that. Verse, so that's, that now explains why it goes off on that. You may call it a tangent. It's not really. A t- it's, it looks like a tangent, but he's going somewhere. He wants to start talking now about the will of God. So, verse twenty-eight. And we know that in all things, so no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what's going on, the will of God is this: God is working for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. So God has a will, God has a purpose. Just please, that scripture and the word purpose, for the because of what we are studying today in Romans chapter 9, just keep that at the back of your mind because we are going to get back to this word purpose shortly. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. Again, so two things now. Another word I want us to write down, keep at the back of our minds that we're going to refer to next, is predestined. So purpose, the will of God, the purpose of God, and those he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that this son, Jesus, will be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Okay, just for completion's sake. Uh, I said I'll spend a few minutes. Okay, yes, I'll have a few more minutes. Just to finish off Romans chapter 8. So Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? To the fact that God works all things together for good. To the fact that the Spirit intercedes in accordance to the will of God. 
to the fact that God works all things together for good for those who have been called according to his purpose, to the fact that that purpose includes the fact that God already knows us beforehand and predestines us before we were even born to be like Jesus, so that Jesus will not only be the only son, the only, he's the only begotten, but God wanted to have more sons, more daughters. So he says, you know what? These guys are destined to be like him so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. brothers. And those he predestined, then after they are born, or at least when they're in their mother's womb, he calls them, justifies them, and then glorifies them. So Paul is saying, what do we say to these things? He's trying to go somewhere. If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, God has already set all these things up in place. Who can even be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, or how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I like the way Paul does this. He's asking questions, making us think through. If God can give his thing, is only, be, God has no, at that point, had only one begotten son. Only one. And they have many begotten sons, just one. If he could give him up, what was that precious to him? How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, everything else? So no matter what we're asking for, we should always remember this. God, it's, just ask him. He will give it to you. So that solves that. This is what Paul is saying. What do we say in response to these things? What else do we say? What's our confession? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will? No one. Because God has already justified. The judge has already spoken. You are acquitted. You are not guilty. So there's nobody who can bring any charge because there's no charge to bring. They bring the charge and they look at the record. It's already paid for. Who then is the one who condemns? So this is where the enemy tries to play these tricks. That, oh, God is condemned. No, no one can condemn. Why? Because Christ Jesus died, was raised to life, and is currently at the right hand of God also interceding for us. So look at the level of intercession going on. Remember I said something last week about the fact that even Satan is making his own request to God concerning us. And I gave the example of how Jesus said in, I think, Luke 22, 23, somewhere there, Peter, Peter, or Simon, Simon, Satan has taken permission to sift you. But I prayed for you. So the Holy Spirit is interceding. We read that earlier. Helping us to intercede. And then God, I mean, and then Christ Jesus is currently at the right hand of God interceding. So the role of prayer. I mean, if the Spirit and the Son are praying, please <laughs> join the frequency. Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, in fact, because you are loved by God, the enemy tries to harass. So that's why you get all this stuff. Yeah, because you can be thinking, well, how come? If God has done all this, how come? That's the very reason. For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For Paul is convinced. Now it says, for I am convinced. I pray today that I myself, Everyone listening to me in the building, in the auditorium here uh, in Roselle, and everyone watching online will all be like Paul, absolutely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. You know, Scripture says in Romans chapter 4 concerning Abraham that the guy was absolutely convinced. I believe that's the translation that says this. NIV says he was fully persuaded, absolutely convinced that God was able to do what he promised. I'm praying today that we all get there, that we all become absolutely convinced, fully persuaded, because 
The enemy does all these tricks. And once you're not fully convinced or persuaded, you can get swept off. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, principality powers, whatever they may be, powers in the spirit, powers here on earth, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right. So that ends Romans chapter 8. Uh, if there's any question about Romans chapter 8, please post it online. Um, wow, okay. Uh, I see. Let me just quickly go to YouTube. Okay, I see people who are there already. Thank you for joining. Good evening. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Good to have you. Let's go to Facebook. Okay. The website. All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, any questions about Romans chapter 8, please post it. Um... In the auditorium, anybody, Romans chapter 8, any questions? All right, okay. Then we will go to Romans chapter 9. Okay. So we're going to go into today, uh, uh, the lesson 10, title being Israel's Rejection of God. I mean, add to that, and uh, God's Sovereign Choice Predestination. So we'll begin with uh, Romans chapter 9. I'll quickly read from verse 1 through to 5. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through to 5. It's in the outline. It says, uh, this is Paul speaking. Now, remember, he just came off talking about um, the beautiful things God has done in Romans chapter 8. I just read it, how we are more than conquerors, how God is willing to give us everything else graciously, just like he gave us his son. So he starts off by saying this because he's concerned about his people Israel. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So we see here, Paul is concerned about his people. I mean, Paul is not hiding here. He's saying, I am an Israelite. I'm an Israeli. I'm, an, I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm a citizen of Israel. But most of my people don't believe in Jesus. In fact, they hate him. And he's saying, I have great sorrow. You know, I wish I myself was cut off so that these people may be saved. It's like his personal team. This is family. This is family. Some of us are family members who are not saved. So I have it here. Paul expressed concern for his people by saying he would willingly take their punishment if that could save them. While the only one who can save us is Christ, Paul showed a rare depth of love. Like Jesus, he was willing to sacrifice for others. 
So my first question for the day, we have a lot of questions today, and I'm hoping we all participate. How concerned are you for those who don't know Christ? How concerned are you for those who don't know Christ? Let me put this in here. How concerned are you for your people who don't know Christ? Your family members who don't know Christ? Your country folks who don't know Christ? How concerned are you, if you're American, for Americans who don't know Christ? How concerned are you if you're Israeli, for Israelites who don't know, who don't know Christ? You know, this, this is uh, Agape House is worldwide now, global. We're talking about Agape House Asia, so I have to start mentioning other countries. How concerned are you about other Caribbeans who don't know Christ? How concerned are you about Nigerians who don't know Christ? How concerned are you about Ghanaians who don't know Christ? How concerned are you about Indonesians who don't know Christ? About Indians who don't know Christ, if that's where you're originally from? about Puerto Ricans who don't know Christ, about Colombians who don't know Christ. How concerned? You know Christ. You are getting the benefits. You are now a son of God. You can go to God. You have the Holy Spirit interceding for you. It's not as if Satan says, oh, we all know it's not playing fair. He's starting wars, causing famine. You know, we have these things. We can pray. We can run to God. We know we have God. So how concerned are you for those who don't know Christ, especially your family? Are you willing to sacrifice your time, money, energy, comfort, and safety to see them come to faith in Jesus? How often? Are you praying for them? How often are you asking God for wisdom, for God to open up their eyes, for wisdom on how to approach, or how your speech should be with grace, seasoned with salt? How are you making sure your, your conduct, your behavior, is not putting them off? How are you making sure because you want them to be saved, you are doing everything you are talking to God, you are following what God is saying to make sure they get saved. All right. So, the next part of uh, Romans chapter 9 um, is... Uh, Paul's is God's choice of Israel. Most of Romans chapter 9 that we're going to be going to now talks about God's choice. We're going to learn that God actually can choose. God reserves the right to choose. So, let's go. Romans chapter 9, we're continuing. Um... Verse 4 to 5. In fact, okay, let me, let me start from verse 3. This is Paul speaking, so it's in context. Paul speaking says, For I, Paul, could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. So Paul is already saying, his people Israel, God already chose them. It says theirs is the adoption to sonship. So God already made a choice. Um, let's see. Can someone read Exodus chapter 4 from verses 21 to 23? Exodus 4, 21 to 23. Yeah, I think 
the mic. Thank you. Exodus uh, 4, 21 to 23. Yes. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. That I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me, that you refused to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn, firstborn son. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. So there you go. The Lord is calling Israel his son. So theirs was the, adopt, the original adoption to sonship. Now remember, in Romans chapter 8, we're talking about, if you remember, that the Lord adopted us as his sons and pulled in us the spirit of his son, that, um, who bears witness with us, that we're God's sons. As many as are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. So Paul is, is going somewhere here now. Because remember, he's talking about he's, he's feeling this anguish. He's feeling this concern for the people of Israel, who in his mind should know better. Theirs is the original adoption to sonship, the initial adoption to sonship. It says theirs is the divine glory. I mean, God revealed his glory to them, right? Remember the glory, the glory cloud in the wilderness? It says theirs are the covenants. God made covenants with them. The covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. Theirs is the receiving of the law. Why is that important? Let's read Psalm 147, 19 to 20. I'll read real quick. It says, he has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. Did you see that? So in the Old Testament, it was only the people of Israel, for the most part, that had a relationship with God. They were that special. Can you imagine if we were born at that time? We'll all be worshiping God's idols, we won't even have a clue. So now you see why all these cultures have idols and all that, and the devil keeps trying to bring, go there, oh no, the religion, Christianity is the religion of, of the white man of Europe, all those lies that it does, so that people can go back to what their ancestors were doing. Because in that time, it was only the Israelites who had that relationship. God gave them the law. Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 8, because of time we won't read it. God was actually saying, I'm giving you these laws to give you wisdom and to live so that you're not just living anyhow. You're not a man marrying 20 wives. You're not a man just doing whatever you are. You're not stealing other people's stuff. So you know how to live. God gave them all that. Theirs is the temple worship. The privilege of worshiping God. It's a privilege to worship God. There's, oh, this is special. There's are the promises. The Israelites had the promises of God. There's are the patriarchs. I'm sure we've all heard this before. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's all Israel. Of whom God is so named. And to top it all up, from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. God over all, 
forever praised. So when God was going to choose which lineage he was going to come through, he decided to choose Israel. So I have a question. It's not here. But I think it's very critical to what we're going to be talking about shortly. Did the people of Israel, was the, did they do anything? Was there something that they did that made them deserve all this? Anybody wants to answer? Is there something that they did that made them deserve all this? I mean, out of all the nations on earth, these nations existed. There were Americans at the time. I mean, they may not have called them Americans. We called them native, whatever you want to call them. They were here. Why didn't God choose them? There were, I'm sure, there were black people at the time. There were Nigerians, there were Africans. He may not have called them then. So what made them special? Anybody wants to take a crack at it? In the building, in, uh, let's see, YouTube, Facebook. Wow, Bible students. Nobody said anything. <laughs> or maybe you think they did something. Hey. It's not a trick question. We all know the answer to this. I'm sure whatever you say is probably right. Anybody? Yes, please, the mic. Good evening, everyone. Um, the Israelites didn't do anything that deserve God's choice. It's just that God has the power to bless whoever he wants to bless and to choose whoever he wants to choose. So in this case, he chose them, not out of their merit, but because of his love. Just like he chose us, even in this day, he chose us first, even before we try to love him back. Amen. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So, there was nothing that they did. In fact, if you remember the story of Genesis chapter 12, I've always looked at it very well. Or you can read 11 to see if there's anything that Abraham did. It just says, God just, just called Abraham. There's nothing. If you read the story very well, there's nothing special about Abraham. God just said, you know what? Abraham, leave your household. I'll go to a place that, uh, you know, that I'm going to give you. And Abraham just, for whatever reason, went. So there's nothing that uh, was that he, that he did to deserve being called. Uh, let me see what people have said online. Thank you, Sister Ify, for the answer. Uh, Sister Joyce says, no Israelites. Israelites did nothing to deserve God's love. JW says, I don't think so, but I do think that because of Abraham's faith in God, that's why his descendants were blessed. Okay. Uh, Sister Osha Worried also says, good question, I can't say. Sister Bissi Dallas says, they were chosen because of Abraham. Uh, Sister Joyce says, it was only by God's election through grace. Awesome. Those are all fantastic answers. Yes. God originally chose Abraham, nothing he did, and then his descendants just got the blessing because the Lord chose Abraham. All right. So that is critical to what we're going to go to next. Uh, the next, well, to what we're going to go to next. But before we go there, I think we should answer this question. The original question I put here in the, in the outline. What does Paul mean when he says it is not as though God's word had failed? Uh, that is, oh, uh, I believe that's Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Let me just quickly read to make sure it's there. Yeah. So talking about the Israelites, theirs is verse 5. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. 
Verse 6, it is not as though God's word had failed. Any takers? Let me see what NLT says. So maybe that will help us understand it better. Well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? Let me put it in context. This, you want to answer, Sister Effie? You want to try, please. Da, 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 da. And he said, what does Paul mean when he says it is not as though God's word had failed? You know, loving them so much, blessing them so much, taking care of them, watching over them by cloud, by fire, you know, even made the you know, Messiah to come through them. He really showed them love. Still, they chose not to love God. They chose not to serve God. So it's like, after all these things I've done for you, I didn't treat you bad. I did not fail you. Then you just decided to ignore me, to go your own way. Awesome. Thank you, Sister Effie. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Anybody else wants to add to that? Let me also introduce another concept. Sister Effie is absolutely, absolutely correct. But let me also introduce another concept. When God speaks a word, that word does not return to him void. Even when it involves people. When God calls you a son, you are a son. That's it. Because that word has the potential to make you, even when you are doing stupid things, to, to reset you back to where you're supposed to be. So the Apostle Paul is saying here, it is not as though God's word that these are my children, has failed. God cannot fail. His words can never fail. Mike. Yes, the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away before my word. That's what God says. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Online, Sister Bees is asking, please, sir, what is the question again? It's in... Uh, <laughs> It's in the outline. It says, question, before, before we go to God's sovereignty, it's the last thing. What does Paul mean when he says it is not as though God's word had failed? And that's what we've been trying to answer. So God's word cannot fail, will not fail. God predestined them to be his sons and daughters. That has to happen. It's not going to fail. Once God has said, you are my son, that's it. In fact, this is the part of scripture that, that always interests me. In the book of Psalms, I don't know if it's Psalm 110 or Psalm 2. They both almost say the same thing about the Messiah. It says, today, talking about Jesus, you have become my son. You are my son. That's, that's it. It's not going to change. So there's no way the devil can tempt Jesus from today till Tomorrow, it was just wasting his time with those temptations. The word of God cannot fail, will not fail. So, but in this instance, it looks as if it was failing. That's why Paul had to put that in there. Because even though theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the law, all these things that Jesus, God did, remember where we started off from? They don't believe. In fact, they are enemies of the gospel. And then Paul answers his own question. So there's a lot of Paul answering, asking questions and answering the question. And what does he say? Romans chapter 9, 6 to 12. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. I believe we read in Romans chapter, let me see. Romans chapter, is it two? Yes. Uh, I believe it was, well, when we did Romans chapter two. Verse 29, I'll quickly read. 
verse 28 to 29. A person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor a circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So, you can call yourself a Jew all you want. You can call yourself Israel. But God's Israel is different. So, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Let's continue. Nor because there is descendants are they all Abraham's children. So you can be a descendant of Abraham, but in God's eyes, you are not Abraham's child. I hope you are following what Paul is saying here. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. He's quoting a scripture there. We all remember, God had how many, I mean, Abraham had how many children? Ah, okay. Bible, okay, I don't want us to go into that right now. That's an interesting thing. But I just want to remind us, we know he had Ishmael before Isaac. And even after Isaac was born, if you read it very well, he had other children. He took another wife. I mean, that's just a man that was 100 years old. That's just God going over and beyond his promise. But just so that we know. But as far as God was concerned with his blessing, with his promises, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, verse 8 it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, you see? It's introducing a concept. God's children, Abraham's children. But it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return. And Sarah will have a son. Remember Paul is still trying to describe something, saying it is not everyone that's Israel, that's Israel. It is only the ones that the Lord promised. Those are the people that God sees as his children that the word of God will not fail on. Remember, is. Paul is building up something. He says, not as if the word of God has failed. It cannot fail. It will not fail as far as the children of promise are concerned. All right. For this was, so we talked about that. For verse 10. Okay. I think why Paul said that <clears throat> there were so many prophecies came out of Israel. So many promises. And when the Messiah came, the people of Israel, they didn't recognize him. So, you know, there were so many promises and prophecies came out of Israel and they crucified their Messiah, you know, not knowing, not recognizing him. So that's why Paul said, it's not like God's word has failed, you know. That's, that's my understanding to that, you okay. know. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Brother Jason. Thank you. Awesome. So, Paul takes this further. He says, not only that, but Rebecca, because now you can say, well, maybe all of Isaac's, since Isaac is the chosen one, right? But not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by her father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born, uh, okay, let me, pause, let me throw this in there for, uh, there's a lot to throw in here. Because the apostle is throwing so many things, and I want us to get this. So number one, all of us here now, Abraham is your father. You have to get that. Because when you read Genesis, you read it very differently. When you understand the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham is your father. The reason I'm stopping is because he also mentions Isaac as our father. Remember, this letter is written to the Roman church. 
which included Jews and Gentiles. So he's already talking about you are engrafted into this promise. So when God says, Abraham, I've made you a father of many nations, you understand why now you are it. You are part of that many nations that God is choosing to make part of, to get into that tree. All right, so let's move on. I don't want to, you know, drop too many things and confuse people. So let's go. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by her father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told. We all know the story. Rebecca, you know, took her a while to get pregnant. When she eventually got pregnant, the babies were jostling in her, so she went to inquire of God. God was going, why am I many having this stuff going on? I mean, this is a lot. And then they told, they said, there's something going on. But the older will serve the younger. The Lord said that before they were even born, before they did anything good or bad, because the apostle is trying to get something to our brains. That has been trying to say it since the beginning of Romans. Because we always have this thing in our minds about a cause and effect relationship with God. If I do this, God must do this. If I pay my tithe completely this week, next week, God must bless me hundredfold. It doesn't work like that. Before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, he was told the older will serve the younger. So I have a question. Is God unfair? Please, I want answers. And if whatever you are saying, I want you to tell me why. Yes, Sister Ife. And I want more participation in the building. Is God unfair? I mean, you have to have an opinion. And tell me why. I will say God is not unfair. Uh, the book of Romans 8, I believe verse 28, made us to understand that God has a will for us and purpose for us. So, and he predestined, he you know, those he chose, you know, Confirm them to the image of God. He glorifies them. He justifies them. So that's his purpose for the older one. He has plan and purpose for them. And that's what he want. He want them to live to the purpose and the plans he has for them. So I think what he was, what he was doing, he wasn't unfair, but he just want each and each of the child or to fulfill purpose just as we Pray to God that we want to fulfill purpose, the plan and purpose of God for us. We want to live to it. And we know that God has a will for us and a purpose for us. So I believe that's his will for the twins, you know, the older and the younger. That's his will for them before they even arrive. Okay. So you're saying, okay, I see what you're saying. So you're saying it's not fair because God just made them go according to his purpose. So, So okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let me play the advocate. So you're actually saying that God was fair to Esau in this thing. <laughs> wow. I love the apostle. He's really making us think. <laughs> apostle Paul. <laughs> go, go to the mic. Ah, man. You know, his own sovereign sovereign choice um <clears throat> so is that sovereign? why did god choose jacob why did he reject esau he must have i mean most people would said he must have seen something in jacob more than he saw something in esau um then we remember two things we read through the book of genesis jacob was like a scoundrel just as much as Esau. Esau was a piece of work, but so, so was Jacob. He was a cheat. He was a liar. 
to his father, stole his brother's birthright. <laughs> but Brother Jason, it says before they were born, before, before they, they were even born. did anything good right, or bad. Right. Oh, you are I'm, saying I'm, God saw what they were going to do, even yes, though they are not done. Yes, oh, okay. Yes. I'm, okay. I'm trying to figure saying. out. Yeah. Okay. All right. I see what you're um, saying. But. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting one. It's 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 kind of tricky, right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It make, it <laughs> Trust me, I agree with you. You know why God choose? <laughs> because I don't think God, you know, is choosing one over one because one is not. I mean, He has purpose for them. He has purpose the for the both of them. That's the know? word. Okay, I'm happy we're getting to that word. <laughs> no, no, you actually you tried and you did well. Good job, brother Jason. Thank you for that, sister Ify. We're I'm happy we arrived at that word, purpose. Remember when I was reading through Romans chapter 8? I said, hold on to this, because Romans chapter 8 says, God works all things together for good to them that are, love him and are called according to his purpose. All right, let me see the people online. Wow. Okay. Uh, wow, people are giving... Scripture reference to the story of uh, Abraham's other sons. Thank you, Sister B.C. Uh, because of unbelief, Israelites were broken off, but God has a plan to save them at the end of Gentile salvation. Okay, Romans, we're not in Romans 11 yet, but hey, there's someone coming after me, a professor. We'll take that. Uh, to, the, to the question, is God unfair? Sister Joyce says, no, God is always fair. He has mercy on whom he will. Whatever God does is fair because he is, well, because he is God. Okay, Sister Bissi. <laughs> it is impossible for God not to be unfair. It's to be, all right, let's see how the apostle who asked the question answered his own question. All right, verse 13 of Romans chapter 9, it says, uh, Just as it is written, of verse 12, Not by works, but by him who calls, he was told the older will serve the younger. That's verse 12, verse 13. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust or is God unfair? Not at all. Verse 15. For he says to Moses, is quoting from Exodus chapter 33, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It therefore does not, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Another question, we have a lot of questions today, why? We are really running out of time. What does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy? I guess people didn't know Romans chapter 9 is. <laughs> he shared more. This is Romans chapter 9, man. This is interesting. Ah, all right. Whereas the people in the building are. Okay, please. The mic. You want to ask? That's fine. It's okay. We're all in this together. <laughs> type of scriptures. Please, so that people like can hear. Yeah. yeah, when I come across, across this type of scriptures or reading through something like this, like God is saying, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy on to. But at the same time, most especially this uh, Romans 9, I remember a few years back when we were dealing with Romans and you, well, I think you were teaching this uh, chapter that, on that day too. And you made mention that when we were leaving our house, we have so many clothes in our closet. And what made us decide on that today, this is what we are wearing. Does it mean that the others are not, are not good or what? So that's the point, the position that God is he has so many things, and he shows what he wants to do. But at the same time, I'm still like, 
<laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank, I find now that you bring it up, I remember. Thank you so much. Wow, the Holy Spirit works well. I, wow, I should always remember that example. Thank you. You answered all that. You helped us out. Right, Jason is still. Paul was saying that he had two sons, Isaac and Jacob, right? Um, which one of them? Which one of them? No, no, you say He's, Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Okay. Yes, uh-huh. Esau, yeah, yeah. Which one of them he was, God was going to choose to, to, to bless? I think that's the question that Paul wanted to uh, Yeah, so. Um, I, I don't know. How is he going <laughs> to choose them? In the, in the mind of all, <laughs> I, I don't know, but, you know, it's one of them. One of them supposed to bring forth uh, God's. Word, you know, God yeah. chose that one, but I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, wow, and for time, let's let's move on real quick. Um, All right, I hope the people online. Okay, I think it's going online now. What my sister is sharing, so they can respond to that. Awesome. Okay, um, so Romans nine fifteen to 18, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So the apostle takes it up even a notch higher. You're thinking, okay, God just chooses some people, you know, and then that's fine, leaves everybody else alone. But then... <laughs> I, think, I, I think, you know what I just heard, like, God, God would choose the son because of the, the earthly rules, like the first one. The mic. <laughs> right? Jason is still yes. he's trying to figure God out. It's like the Holy Spirit is talking to me. But I, I think he's he he um God is gonna choose by the earthly rule, you know, that man have the, the firstborn always inherit whatever um the parent has or not. So he would bless the firstborn. Okay, yeah, but this one was the younger one. Yes, the younger one. Yeah, but he chose the younger one in this case. Right. Yeah, so you're saying, you, oh, he was just trying to upset the natural order of things? Um, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Jason. Thank you. All right, so um, this part of Scripture, what it does for me personally is it makes me really, really fear God. It brings me to such an awesome realization of who he is and what he does. So for example now, God could have made you an animal and you won't even know. Think about that for a second. Or a tree. Or a stone. White, it could have been black, Asian, it could have made you anything. But he decided to make you who you are today, and he decided to choose you as his own. At the end of the day, predestination works for you. You should have a profound appreciation of the Father and fear him because of what he's done for you. Because you can choose to have mercy on one and harden another one. He actually built up Pharaoh. So only God knows how many political leaders that we have today. I'm not going to mention any names. That God is just building up, setting them up. They're having a good time. They are building up their, whatever they are building up. They're like men, yes. Just like Pharaoh was like, 
We are going to get these Israelis. And then all because God just wanted to show his glory. So we should have profound gratitude to God when we are worshiping him. If you think about this very well, you worship him like anything else. It is a privilege to worship this awesome God. Wow, time is almost gone. All right. Let me see what's going on online. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, what he means. He chose one and didn't choose the other one. For those online, um, Brother Jason is asking, what does it mean uh, that Esau, I, Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated? Yeah. <laughs> okay. He just wants to know what it means. Okay. I wish you had gone to the mic to ask the question. So I didn't know. Yeah, just, I understand. <laughs> so, uh, let's open to the scripture real quick. Um, so, uh, verse, let's start from verse, um, verse 10 to 13 to get it all in context. Romans chapter 9. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by her father Isaac, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, he was told the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Which is when I asked the question, is God unjust? No. In re- relative to what God did for Jacob, you will really think God hates Esau. I, I did, I so did, that's... that's he, he just changed the rule. Because as I was saying, that early man, they would, they would bless their first son. Mm-hmm. They say, okay, my first son is the heir of my throne. Okay. I would bless him. Yeah. God yeah, you could say that, but because God had a purpose. Remember, this is all because of God's purpose. You had mentioned that earlier. So God has a purpose in what he's doing. It, that may be the case. That may not be, but God has a purpose in what he's doing. So, but what I want us to get is this. This paragraph, the fallacy of gaining salvation by human effort remains as strong as ever. People still think good intentions are the key to unlock the door to eternal life. By the time they get to try the lock, they will find that their key does not fit. Others imagine that their efforts are building an invisible ladder to heaven. People are so busy trying to reach God that they completely miss the truth that God has already reached out to them. We cannot earn God's mercy. Please. We cannot. If we could, it would not be mercy. We are all dependent on God's mercy. This is so critical because a lot of us as Christians, we get into this. We are mercy, so we get saved. But then we tend to forget, and we start going back to work so we become born-again Christians. We start trying to impress God somehow, rather than going back to relying on faith and mercy in our relationship with God, which is what Galatians 3 was trying to talk about. You started off with faith, and you're again now trying to now do all these works to impress God. No. You continue with mercy, you continue with faith. Because of time, um, I'll skip to the last part. Why does God still blame us? Why did God make me like this? I believe those are questions we can answer, we can look into at home, and we can uh, we'll try and sort that out, maybe next Bible study. I hope, uh, uh, well, a professor is coming after me, so I'm sure he can handle it. Um, So, I have it here. God, the creator of all things, the potter, reserves the right to make things whichever way he wants. And I love the example my sister just gave. We all wore something to come here today. We just chose what we're going to wear. For whatever reason, you chose it. It doesn't mean the other clothes in in your closet, you hate them or you just, it's just the purpose now, some of us, it's because it's cold. That's why we're wearing this. That's why you're not wearing just a, just a T-shirt. So there are purpose to what we're doing. In the same way, God has purpose to what he's doing. All right, finally, Israel's unbelief and rejection of God. Remember, this is all started off by what is happening with Israel. God chose them, and some of them are still missing enough stuff. So I'll read Romans chapter 9, 30 to 33. 
and we'll try and close. All right. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. That's talking about you and I. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Remember, Paul started off this thing by being very concerned for Israel, his own blood, his own kin, who had all these promises from God. He says, the Gentiles who are not even looking for this stuff, they were not even looking. Somebody just comes preach the gospel, boom, and they get saved. You know? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. I want us to please get this. Get this as believers online, if you're listening to me. Please, please, please. Don't wind up being like the Israelites. You have started off by faith. You started off by mercy. Don't ever think that your righteousness with God is based on what you do. It's not. It's by his mercies. All right? Verse 32. Why not? Because they proceed not by faith as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Please, so that you do not wind up like the Israelites who are missing it, do not stumble over the stumbling stone. Continue to believe. Continue to walk based on the grace of God and on faith in Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just a quick word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for these studies. Lord, we ask, Lord, that as we go home, I ask, precious Holy Spirit, give more insight. More insight, more insight, more insight. That we will walk with you by faith in accordance to your compassion and your mercies and your grace. Not by works, Father, so that we don't stumble over the stumbling stone in our walk with you. And that your word concerning us will not fail. Thank you, precious Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, everyone. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's time for our tithes and offering. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're doing your tithes and offering, please, there are different ways to give. They'll be displayed on the screen. Um, we can text to give our app. Cash App, Zelle, uh, I think the app is the fastest way to do it. Um, also, if you're in the sanctuary, there's an envelope. Where you can, I have the envelope here. You can use, put cash, and then there are boxes to my left and to my right on the tables where you can put it. Awesome. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, thank you for joining us. This has been wonderful. There's more like this to come. AR, we go into this, we ask these questions, Bible studies, where we really, really go deep into the Word of God. Please continue to join us. Hallelujah. Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, a quick prayer over the offerings. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gifts that your children have given today. We ask, Lord, please let them be acceptable to you in your sight. Bless these offerings. We ask, oh God, that you bless as many as have given today. In the name of Jesus, open up the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing that there will be not enough room for them to hold in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 A few announcements. Command your month is tomorrow, March 31st, Thursday, via phone at 9 p.m., Please join us to command the month of April. That's about to begin. It's awesome. We've finished the first quarter of 2022 already. Okay, another event that's coming up is this Friday, April the 1st, our fresh outpouring service. I believe by the special grace of God, it is going to be power-packed. We're going to get the Holy Spirit poured out on us so that we can live the Spirit-filled life 
that we've been studying about in Romans chapter 8, come and experience the mercies of God, the compassions of God in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's at 8 p.m. here in the auditorium. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. All right. Let's try and close the service. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, for me to facilitate this Bible study. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit, for speaking through me, helping me to teach. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who has contributed. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for their insights. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that which you've learned through them. Also, those online who have contributed. Thank you for everyone who has been listening. Thank you, Lord, for giving us insight into your ways, your ways that are sometimes beyond searching up. Father, we're asking for more and more of this, that every member of Agape House of Worship will know you from the least to the greatest. We will know you and your ways. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. If love endured that ancient cross, how precious is my Savior's blood. Beauty of heaven wrapped in washing The image of love upon death's frame If heaven my heart was worth the pain What joy could you see beyond Yeah.